I'm Jolene Jang. Welcome to Women Who Go For It. The mission is to empower women to take action on what's important to them. By meeting these dynamic women, we're going to learn about their best practices so we can ponder, adopt, adapt, and get inspired to make progress in our own lives. We're going to take a peek into the past and spend most of the time in the present and preparing for the future. We're going to look at their obstacles and what they've done to cope and manage them. Today's guest is Stacy Hunky, a communication expert from Chi-Town. She gives keynotes and runs the C-Suite experience, which is for executives to maximize their ability to communicate and influence others. She's also going to share what she means when she says Monday to Monday. And we'll understand what she learned from dairy farming. And does she really think in tweets? And should you? She also has a challenge assignment for us. So let's do that homework. Stacey Hunky, you are coaching a lot of executives with the communication and their influence. Were there signs of that growing up as a kid? Mm -hmm. There were. To tie it to what the communication with influence, it's I'm so intrigued with body language, right? I'm so intrigued with why do we behave the way we behave and we don't know we're doing it. And growing up, a little history, and you know a little bit about this, is I grew up on a farm. So my father was a dairy farmer. He still is at 74. He's still doing what he loves to do. And I was always so intrigued. If you think about farming, there is the knowledge behind why do you plant what you plant, and you have to rotate the fields, and you have to know when is the right time to sell, when's the right time to plant and what you're planting. I was so intrigued, I was very inquisitive as a child on how does he know that? Like mm. why is he doing what he's doing? And there's, I know it seems like a, a disconnect, but that whole inquisitiveness was always, always there. And then as I started to work for companies doing what I do today, I was just intrigued with how can we behave the way we behave, but we know, don't know why we're doing it. We're, we're completely clueless we're doing what we're doing, and then not realizing how we behave is how people respond, whether that's positive or negative. And suddenly now you're talking loss of profits and loss of results because of our lack of knowledge of how people experience us. So go backwards, because you're moving quickly here. How did you go from the farm field to mm -hmm. what you do now? So you were curious, you asked lots of questions. Mm -hmm. Were there signs in school? Mm -hmm. I mean, were you that kid? Oh, 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 Chris, I have a question. Well, well, Only the, 10 more. <laughs> exactly. Well, the sign there was I was the one that always had to stay after school because I talked too much and had to write pages from the, the vocabulary or from the dictionary. And you're like, oh, I love exactly. all the vocabulary. And I remember, I remember when I graduated, I, I thanked my one of my high school professors and I said, you have just well, given me a wealth of knowledge behind my own vocabulary. But the, the inquisitiveness was always there. I always want to know the why. I was always, if, if you gave me an equation, or you asked me to do something, I always wanted to know why, why would I do that? What impact is that going to have? That's also that direct tie into what I do today. Okay, so now go to today. When you think back to the farm now, give us the parallel, will you? Mm -hmm. So when I look at, I was treated, why, how did my dad know what he knew? Like yeah. he, he was inquisitive. And just the, the amount of knowledge I don't think most people realize that a farmer has, there's a lot of strategy behind making sure that, that that's a profit, right? That's all they've got. And there's so much strategy behind why he does what he does and how he knows that and how he was so in tune to it. Well, where I take the parallel is, but how we behave is what we do every day, correct? How come most of us are not aware, especially an executive, because they make it up through the ranks, mm -hmm. depending on how much feedback or lack of feedback that they've gotten, how can an executive not realize that so much of their communication, verbal and nonverbal, determines the profit that they bring in, the clientele that represents them, the teams that follow or don't follow them. And, and if you think about communication as the core to everything that we do, well, for my father, it was planting that field was the core to everything that he did because that was his profit for an executive. I don't re think executives realize how their day-to-day -day communication truly determines their end result and their end profit. So when you're coaching, is this a one-on-one? -on -one? Is it a group? Is it a series? I know you have some books. Yes, it's a combination. And I keep saying we because we've got a team. So we've got three ways that we touch executives. One is through the keynote, 
Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's that's the, really how the company got started. The second is through the mentoring and spending months with these executives, just walking and following them through a lot of the interactions that they're dealing with on a day to day, and picking up with what's working, what's not working. So you're for kind them. of like a spy. Yeah, do, I would do, like to say they're a psychologist, right? And then the third way we do it is that's where the team comes into play, and they go out. They teach the intellectual property. They work with these executives in two-day workshop format. So you have several products, is that right? Mm -hmm. Several profit centers of how we touch executives and how we deliver our work. So for this last book, um, can you share a little bit about it? Yeah, so it's in the process. It's been two years of research because I knew that this has to have really hardcore to prove influence is more than people think it is. And the book title is Redefining Influence. We're still working out the tagline. It'll be something around, I shared with you this earlier, it's going to be something around Monday to Monday, because we believe that if you're going to be influential, it has to be consistent, it has to be Monday to Monday. And the research has been a huge learning for me. It's been research with our clients, interviewing them, and it's also been research around just the statistics and the numbers that are out there. There, there was one just this week that will get inserted in the book that stated 60% of CEOs are not looking for the technical skills. They figure they can teach that. They're looking for the ability to have a conversation. How many are aware that they need help? And how do you, how do you approach that? Because yes. somebody probably says, hey, uh, Stacy, how, mm -hmm. how do you? If they're calling us, they know they need the help. Now, when I say help, it might be someone that just says, I am in, I'm the face of the company. I, I get it that my learning is continuous. I get it, I should always have a coach. Well, they get it, they're a little easier to approach. It's the company that might call us and say, we've got this VP, or we have this director. Yeah, yeah. And we, we go through a quite a, it's a, we call it a listener analysis. It's just really almost like a 360, where we really just dig deep to find out, are we the right coach, number one? Because if it's not a right fit, it, it, nothing that we do will work. We also go deep into their style. We really train to their style. We really go into deep of, just walk me through your day to day. So with your style, what do you mean by style? Style, I, I focus a lot on authenticity. So if it's someone that has lots of energy and, and really outgoing, let, let's tweak that to their style. I don't, I don't want to change them. Mm -hmm. Or you've got someone that's a little bit more reserved. Maybe during a conversation they are more silent. They're the ones that ask the questions while they use that other time while their listener is speaking. They use that time to be thinking on their feet. So we pride ourselves in not changing who people are, but let's enhance the authenticity, make sure their authenticity is consistent Monday to Monday, and then get rid of any of the distractions that they may be creating that they don't realize they're creating. Well, it seems like you'll have a lot of habits for them to change, yes. or so do you give them, for this week, you're going to try and keep your hands still at the mm -hmm. table. I mean, what? Exactly. Very much the, the action steps are the key. We, we call them accountability challenges. We set them up with an accountability partner, which is usually an internal mm -hmm. mentor for them. And if we meet with them, we meet with them monthly and it might be three months, five months, six months, just depending on mm -hmm. how much work they need and they're willing to take. At the end of a first session, say for example, it's their first session, at the end we evaluate what we've seen in the video recordings that we do of them, in the conversations that we've had, they have as much say in their action steps, and that's the power oh, of mentoring, right? There. No, I wasn't, I wasn't interrupting, I was just like, yes. Yeah, because what happens, and, and I'll, I'll tease them, when they come back in month two, you can't hide. I'll be able to tell if you applied it or not. Yeah. And, and the responsibility is in the work of the mentee. I'm just there to guide, to support, and to make sure the recommendations are authentic to their style. I'm doing a number of 30-day challenges because the idea is there's a deadline, there's a goal, and I'll just try and get there, and it's only 30 days. Mm -hmm. Is that we do what you're we do three months, but it is so that three, it's, five, yes, six, three okay. five. Some are with us for a year, and they've just got touch points once a month with us. So it just it really depends where their skill sets are when they first come to us. Most importantly, what are they trying to reach? What's their expectation to accomplish it?
And that that's probably probably one of the most rewarding pieces for me is I think that's been my biggest growth within the company. It's being able to sit with a CEO asking me questions that I'm thinking, okay, I mean, you're, you're definitely challenging me, and, and just learning from them. I think that's also a part where that mentoring process or that partnership works, where I'm always telling them, I'm giving you feedback, fair is fair. This is a two-way relationship here. But that's where that trust starts to get built too with that executive. You've met a lot of CEOs. What's mm -hmm. something different? What are like maybe two, maybe three? aspects that you learn that's very common with CEOs. Yes, so the first quick, because I want to get in there, I want to get in their mind and I want to be able to learn from them as well. It's, well, I always ask that question of what keeps you tossing and turning, like, what is your thing? And every single CEO that I have asked that to is people, managing people. And there was a, this was just last year, I had some challenges on my team that I was trying to manage through and I knew oh, I don't think this relationship's going to work. And I was meeting with the CEO that morning, I asked him that question, he said, you need to hire slow and fire fast. He was, and once you fire fast, you're going to know if you made the right decision because you will sleep tonight. I went home, I did some cleaning house, <laughs> and I thought, you're right, I slept that night. And that's probably been the, the, the biggest challenge, yet consistent challenge, an executive will share with me. There was one too the other day that he said, he backed that up with the hiring slow, firing fast. It's part of running a business. He said, you're never going to make everyone happy. When you, as you climb that ladder, you will always get someone upset based on a decision that you made, a change that you made, or a recommendation you maybe gave them. And it's to be able to let that go and stay focused on the business and keep business and the focus on relationships, just make sure there's a clear line. Clear line. Clear line. No sand. Yes. In terms of habits, what were a couple of habits that kind of surprised you but made sense from these CEOs? I don't know. What the, the first, and it, not so much a habit, but it'll build up into a habit. Yeah. It's they don't know what they don't know. They don't know that they take way too long to get to the point as a leader. They don't know that. Well, nobody's told them because maybe they intimidate that's people. That's it, that's it. And ask for feedback. And we, we talk a lot about how feedback is flawed. Good, nice job. Well, that's not feedback. They're lying to you because they don't want to tell you the truth. Or as an executive, and it, this is another common response from an executive, I love you and I hate you. And I always want to tap into the hate first. And kiddingly, they will say, because you tell me how it is. And I have found as I've moved my way through my career, you get to a level as an executive, the feedback either goes away or people just tell you what they want to hear. That, the habit though, the number one habit is the too long winded. Right. Well, and getting caught up in their own head and their own dialogue, not being able to filter what's happening between them and their listener to adapt on the fly. And that's, that's a lot of skill set training, different mind thinking around what I'm going to ask them to focus on. It's interesting though, because it's, it's consistent. If I just think back to the, the different personality styles and even different industries or length of experience as an executive, how that, that's very consistent. How did you get all your training or your knowledge to create this? Yes, a lot of coaching. I've been very fortunate, the companies that I've worked with, I've had bosses that were my coaches. That was step number one. Then I worked at a company, it was an association. Not only did I train some of our programs to our association members, I hired speakers. And that was oh. a big turning point. There's speakers here today that I hired, which is, which is wild. I would hang onto their shirt tails, I'd ask them to mentor me, they were overly gracious. That was the big curve. And now, till to this day, even when I started out the company, I have a speech coach, I have a business coach, and I have several accountability partners. And it, I'm a big believer, though, if I'm telling an executive to do it, I, I stay true to my integrity, I cannot tell someone to do something if I'm not doing it. Whoa, hey. Yeah, that's. That's a, that's a very big pride in our business that we talk about. Hmm, that's something to think about. Not yeah. committing to that, but. Yeah, yes. 
<laughs> Your accountability partners, what does that arrangement look like? We will email once a week. I'm thinking of one accountability partner yeah. in, in particular. She knows the ins and outs of my business, what my goals are, both personally and professionally. What we do every Friday, we've made a commitment over the last two years that we send a meeting, up, a meeting email update on what did I accomplish based on what did I, what have I shared with you this year on what I wanted to be doing. I have to report into her every week, what did I do this week to get closer to mm -hmm. my commitments, to the goals, to the accomplishments that I want to be having completed either in 30 days, 90 days, or a year, or do six you, months in between. Do you have consequences or incentives besides just letting her down or yourself down? That's the only incentive. It's right there. And it's interesting, your mindset, already mm -hmm. on Monday, I'm thinking, I, I, I have to bring something to table by Friday. It's, it's just, it's really interesting when you report in. I yeah. use the example a lot of anyone that's ever had a workout buddy or a personal trainer. Trainer, If I hire you as my personal trainer and I, we, we get that agreement and then I say to you, okay, call me when you're ready. Like, that's not how it works. That accountability partner, she is not there to have to call me, yeah. but I need to report in. Right. It's it's powerful. I use that example often with all of our clients. You cannot do this idea of influence the way that we're defining it Monday to Monday. I just don't think you can do it on your own. You need to have someone to be there to remind you, someone to lean on, and someone to just push you when you don't want to do something different. Yeah, somebody who cares who will say, uh-uh. Who cares, yes. And that, that is someone that, too, who you can really trust mm -hmm. is not going to give you fluffy, fake feedback that's going to tell you how it is, which is usually how it is through the eyes and ears of everyone around you. Was there a pivotal event that shot you off in the, in the direction of your business? Yes. There, there's definitely there's two pivotal events. The comment that I made earlier about mentoring speakers mm -hmm. and the ones that would truly engage and connect were very heavy content. I shouldn't say heavy. They had content. You walked away with how to's mm -hmm. instead of the raw, you know, the motivational, yeah. and yeah. you go back to life and you start sprinting through it. It was that, and I always thought if I'm going to do this right, I really do want to have the reputation of not only does she connect and engage with us, and we we feel comfortable with her. We know what to do when we're down. Like there's practicality. Yeah. That was one. Then when I started to figure out how to put the business together, I reflect back to when I was doing the work at this association, I would do a lot of intros at our big events. I would introduce the speakers. Oh. And my boss would always say to me, stop using index cards. Because first I went through the whole memorization stage. I would memorize their bio. Well, that didn't work. Then I did the index cards. And I kept saying, I, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine. He kept saying to me, there's going to be a day you're going to drop the cards. I think we've all heard that saying before somewhere in our career. And right before I went on stage, we were in front of 200 plus. It was our national convention. There's a podium on my right. And before we went up there, he had said to me, I think it's time to record you. Just like, right no. before. I'm like, no, nice. no, no, right no, before, right? <laughs> and we argued a little bit. Yeah. Well, then it came down to my job relied on it. Oh. And I'm standing. He's like, <laughs> you, you need to start taking a look. Now, I'm, I, this was early. I was in my early 20s, pretty young. I'm standing in front of this audience. The podium is in my right. And everything that he said was going to happen, happened. The cards fall. And I'm standing up in front of 200 plus people. I'm taking my foot and I'm shuffling the cards underneath the podium as if no one knew. I mean, you can kind of tell how clueless I was. After that, we go to this room, and I, I can see the room. I still can see the room. I can see this with him. We watch just a segment of the video, and he looks at me, and he says, would you want to sit through that? And I remember how that felt. And I remember also thinking, I cannot make a living out of this if I don't start seeing through the eyes and ears of my listeners. That now is such a big part of all the training, all the coaching, the mentoring that we do. And, and to just be able to share with individuals what I've gone through and how humiliating so many months and years of my life were because of that video camera, yet without it, I don't think even our mentoring works. And that's, just, that's such a big part for them to be able to see through the eyes and ears of their listeners. So speaking of you had this situation, when stressful situations arise now, mm -hmm. what do you do to manage them? Mm -hmm. 
There's got to be that learning from it, right? So right. I guess that's the after the fact. As a speaker, is, where everything is, oh, I can, I can use that, right? One of our core values as a team is that we're unflappable. And something I always share with the team is your listeners only know what you just tell them and what you show them. They have no idea what's going on inside as far as how you're feeling. They have no idea what you plan on telling them. And I want you to walk out there. It's the concept of they have not come to here to see me fail unless I prove them wrong, correct? And if I can just give them one thing, I turn the focus off of me. And I know that's easier said than done. And I'll be the first to admit the butterflies still go crazy in the stomach and the nervousness before I get on, on that stage or whatever I'm doing. Yeah. Even with an executive wondering, starting to second guess, what can I tell them? Am I going to be able to help them? Is to get out of your dialogue, get out of your head, and to be able to start switching your focus on what does this person need? What's important to them? And you've got, you've got to be confident to some degree here too. What I've got, they can learn from. If I can just give them one idea, one concept that they can grasp and run with, you've provided value. Now, of course, I want more than one. But if you just well, get, you get out of your baseline, own dialogue. Yeah. Exactly. Think about them, not yourself. It comes back to focus. You know, that, that was another, it's such a big characteristic of my father. You know, he talked about stress. He, he lived his life on Mother Nature and what Mother Nature is going to predict, right? And he was very good about focus on what you can control. And the minute it gets yeah. foggy, and because you're getting foggy and you're getting caught up in your own dialogue and your own stuff and issues, it's focus on what you can have action on. What are two other personality traits that help you? I think in it's your current business. definitely focus, it's discipline, and it's integrity. Yeah, and integrity comes from the farming piece, is I that? Think I think it's more my, my family. I mean, it, it's a lot of it's what they've always ingrained in us. You know, my, my, my parents both always say said to us, my sisters and I, that you will be in the top 1% if you can show up and follow through on what you said you're going to do. And to me, that, that's all part of integrity, too. I mean, just show up. <laughs> yeah. Now, you got to be at your best when you show up. But follow through. And that's our integrity of, I will always follow through on what I say, what I commit to. And as a leader of not only my team, but the people that we have impact on, it's, if I ask them to do something, I'm always doing it, too. But I'm thinking about mm. what you said with the, um, don't ask anybody to do what you won't do. That's tweetable. Oh, you, you left a couple of tweets already. I did, I've been, yeah. And then I, I go on to the next piece and I forget, oh, I forgot to say that. She's, she's thinking in tweets. That's very clever of you, communications. It, it works because now that if you go to, whether it's coaching, mentoring, whatever, whatever we are all doing, they're not going to remember everything you say. And it's our, our big piece is everyone hears Monday to Monday. I think about it. I think about how you're telling me it's about being the best that you can be, being consistent and congruent with your body language and your messaging Monday to Monday. So starting on Monday, mm -hmm. in terms of your daily habits, you are focused, you're disciplined. Yes. How do you start your days? Mark LeBlanc is yes. my business coach. And he, oh, eight years, nine years now? I don't, I don't wow. even know. Wow. So it's been a long time. Yeah. And one thing I learned very early from him is when you get to your office, you just take the post-it note, and we all have post-it notes, and you're going to write the yes and question. Can you explain that? Mm -hmm. You're going to write down three action steps that you're going to take that day that has impact, positive impact on your business. Now, sometimes I'll do it even in my personal life. And it, now it's like eating lunch. Even if you eat lunch at your desk every day, you still have to eat. It's such a habit. It's the first thing that I do. And what happens when you've got those action steps staring at you, I literally put it on my computer monitor, you have them staring at you. I want to get them done by noon. Mm. And with, what's the trick here? They do not roll over into Tuesday. You can't replicate. <laughs> you can't accumulate yes. to-dos throughout the week. It goes back to focus, though, Jolene, because you're, it's right there. you got to focus on those. For example, it might be 10 client calls, blog, new marketing strategy. And what I'll coach my executives to do after that first mentoring session, all right, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, first thing you're going to do, you're going to write this down. You're going to write down action steps. Now, you get three, 
one of those needs to be around your presence and your influence skills. Do they have consequences? I they just the, hire I you think for the, longer. I think the consequences, well, there is some measuring <laughs> on their end yeah. based on they're, they, they're showing the videos that I do with them. They have to show it to whoever they report to. So that's it. Or they might even just have to report in on what we did, what we didn't do. I'm part of also that process where I'm on the phone with them and their direct supervisor or whomever they're reporting to to make sure that there's accountability when I'm not with them. The other piece, though, is it's like a golf lesson. I know when I took golf lessons, if I was not going to the driving range in between my lessons, yeah. well, when I would go back to see my coach, he or she knew right away <laughs> that I did nothing with it. <laughs> so that's, you can't hide this material. Either you can tell someone's doing it or they're not. And it's not consequences on me, it's consequences on them, personally and professionally. So how do you close your day? I was listening to Darren Hardy. Mm -hmm. I'm a big Darren Hardy fan. Mm -hmm. Me too. I was Are just you? listening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's I no need to say no more if anyone who's listening knows Darren Hardy. And years ago, he made a comment, end your day like a parent ends the child's day or you got to clean up your toys, right? Oh. And he relates it to just get rid of it. Get rid of what's on that desk so the next day you come in mm -hmm. clean. I do a big mental recap. Sometimes it is that to-do yeah. list. Mental recap of what did I do that day. So it, it's focus. I don't have many days at my desk. So that day has to be, it has to be there. I'll recap the day. I reflect on tomorrow. And any of that final cleanup done so I can sleep at night. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a lady called the fly lady that talked about clean your sink. Uh, this whole study on clean, my mom told me about it. Yes. And I do clean my sink, but I did that before, thanks. <laughs> Is there anything else that we miss that my audience of ladies would like to hear? I think I, it would challenge who's ever listening to this is find someone who you can, in the next 24 hours, find someone who's really honest with you and take the commitment, the challenge, the courage that it'll take to just ask them, give me feedback. How do I come across? Well, when we're, whether I'm listening to you or when we're in interaction, give me feedback. And maybe you find someone in your personal life and your professional life. So that's step number one. You do that in 24 hours. And then this week, audio or video record yourself three times. Doing anything? In a conversation. So it could be you're on a call with a client and just press record on your smartphone. It's super simple to do. Maybe you're in a meeting. Maybe you do have something. Maybe you're doing a training session. Maybe you are facilitating a board meeting or you're doing a presentation where you can record yourself or have someone just prop up the iPad. So it's not like really yeah. obvious. Yeah. It's simple to do because one of the excuses people will say to me, I don't have a camera. You don't need a camera. Just use your smartphone. It's all you have to do. If they did those first two steps yeah. in 24 hours and in one week, I bet in a week they would have a completely different strategy laid out for them personally and professionally, and they'd finally get a chance to see through the eyes and ears of their listeners. That is so yours, the eyes and the ears mm -hmm. of the listeners. And the idea of recording ourselves in a natural, because I'm recording myself all the time, but it's not natural. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the idea if I'm on the phone or just doing something, right. then you can see what your, what your resting natural. face looks like. Well, that's too. your authenticity. You go back to our earlier conversation, it's making sure that how you come across Monday to Monday is also the same when the stakes are high. I think the, the error people make when it comes to influence is, I have a big presentation, I'm going to turn it on and turn yeah, it off. Right. No, no, no. Be who mm -hmm. you are. Mm -hmm. It's just you have to adapt it, your style, to who you're speaking to. Stacy Hunky, and where can we find your online properties? On my website, mm -hmm. www.stacyehankeinc.com. Thank you. Thank you.